Okay. So if you'll all bear with me for, uh, for a minute, I want to go back to where the black market started, because I think it, uh, it, it brings us an important contrast to the market today. Um, 1960s, early 1960s, is really when the uh, anabolic uh, steroid black market really began in any, any kind of recognizable form. Now, the distribution model for steroids when we first started seeing the illegal trade is pretty much this. It was pharmacy driven. Uh, it was occurring at all levels. Um, we had retail distribution, uh, at, at people filling prescriptions and selling them. A lot of wholesale uh, diversion, uh, drug wholesalers uh, pushing them off to dealers. And, uh, and believe it or not, back uh, during this time, there was even uh, illegal distribution from the manufacturers themselves. Um, I'll tell you a little story about an old friend of mine. Uh, I'll call him Jerry for the, uh, for the purpose of this, uh, this discussion. Um, he was a dealer for anabolic steroids in the New York area you know, during the uh, early part of the 1980s. And uh, his supply came directly from one of the, at the time, well-known generic drug manufacturers that was operating in the New York area. Um, to obtain his supply of drugs, he would simply wait till the, uh, the office was closed, and he would meet with one of the owners of the company uh, behind the loading dock, who would literally proceed to fill the trunk of his car with anabolic steroids. Now, during this time, there was not a lot of you know, law enforcement attention given to anabolic steroids. The penalties for diversion were not very large. So this went on for quite some time. And I, I, you can categorize this, um, this market as, as fairly secure. Um, and I want to explain for a minute what it actually means to be a pharmaceutical grade drug. Um, now, anabolic steroids, you know, many of them are, are meant to be given by injection. And this increases, uh, this presents um, a potential strong risk in terms of what you're injecting into your body. Um, when, you're, when you're administering a drug like that, of course, you're bypassing quite a lot of your body's defenses, and um, you're going to be vulnerable if the uh, material you're introducing isn't, uh, isn't sterile or, or properly produced. So pharmaceutical manufacturing begins at the level of the raw material. Um, one of the most important things that you can do is, is obtain um, quality material to work with. In the, uh, in the United States, oh, Just that down with the... perfect. Uh, you know, in the United States, the, the raw material supply is dictated by uh, the U.S. Pharmacopias. Uh, here we have British Pharmacopias. They set the standards. You cannot sell a raw material to a pharmaceutical company unless your product is licensed, approved, and, and meets these standards. Um, now, oh, let me just go back. Not highly important, but you can't, uh, you can't really make it out in this picture, but uh, this bag of raw material had, uh, had originated from, from Organon, which is a very uh, large uh, international supplier. I think they're now owned by Merck or one of the other companies bought them out. So, so you have pure, you know, essentially perfect raw material. It only contains the, the steroid that you're producing. But there's now a lot more uh, that goes into to putting this into finished dosage units. Um, the term is, that's used is aseptic processing. That means that the manufacturing of the steroid final uh, dosage unit is controlled to the point that there is no inclusion of bacteria. Nothing else is, is being introduced uh, into the product. It is, it is absolutely sterile. Um, and there should be no other additional risk, again, of bacteria and stuff like that. Now, pharmaceutical companies also have strict quality assurance policies. They all should be testing their product there are lots before it, uh, it leaves the, the plant. And in fact, you know, most standards today call for um, different, uh, different samples from the same lot to assure that, uh, that the quality is consistent. You know, and lastly, there's accountability for drug companies. Like our, our good friend Cartman uh, reminds us, there are law enforcement, there are regulations. And um, you know, if you're a drug company, you, you have to make sure that your products are, are quality. Um, and if there is certainly a problem, there is going to be a, a price to be paid for it. And um, the, the end result of all this, again, is that a pharmaceutical drug contains exactly what's on the label. It's sterile. The dosage is accurate. There's no additional risk that would be presented to the user with this drug beyond the inherent risk of injecting, um, especially you know, outside uh, you know, a medical facility and with, with the proper um, instruction, and the compound itself, you know, again, pure, no bacteria. 
So this went on for a good 20 or 25 years. Um, you would, during this time, you would, again, say that the market for anabolic steroids on the black market was still very secure. Athletes, bodybuilders had access um, to legitimate pharmaceutical drugs. They dominated the market. Um, it, was, it was very hard to find um, people that were selling bad, poor quality uh, products and counterfeits. Counterfeits did exist for, for many years, but you know, something changed during the late 80s and 90s that uh, I consider this the beginning of the counterfeit steroid era. So again, for like 20, 25 years or so, the market was very secure. Then several things started happening around the same time. Um, one of the biggest things uh, to occur was uh, Dianabol was withdrawn from market. Um, the US government had determined that there was really no viable reason to, to justify uh, this drug being on market. It was entirely or almost entirely being used by athletes and bodybuilders for you know, off-label purposes. This created a huge void in the market. Dianabol was arguably the most popular steroid at the time, and still today is one of the most popular anabolic steroids. Um, so steroid dealers had this enormous demand to fill and very limited supply. Now around the same time, demand was, uh, for steroids was increasing. Um, you know, during the 80s, especially the latter part of the 80s, we started seeing a lot of media attention paid to anabolic steroids. Um, of course, you know, Ben Johnson was a big Olympic scandal, and you know, bodybuilding was starting to become more popular. Um, people were just becoming more introduced to these drugs. And um, so, so you've got demand going up drastically, and at the same time, law enforcement really started cracking down now. It became a, a big public thing. Um, laws were being passed in the United States um, with the early 90s, they, uh, the possession of anabolic steroids actually became criminal. Even in the 80s, they started um, passing new laws and really uh, cracking down on the wholesale diversion of these drugs. Um, whereas, you know, in the early 80s, in the 70s, in the 60s, if you were caught, and many people were caught uh, diverting drugs like this, the penalties were very light. There would be fines. There was really, you know, not much, uh, you know, attention in terms of prison sentences and that kind of thing. And, and that was really... That was changing. So at the same time as the demand is blowing up, the market uh, is really shrinking, at least as far as legitimate uh, drugs came. So counterfeiting started to become a big problem. Now, at first, the counterfeits were often pretty easy to spot. I, I use this as an example. Um, this is a, a, an American, a copy of an American product, Steris, that's testosterone suspension. Here, all that really happened is one label was printed by the counterfeiter. Um, it was put on a plain white box and put on a plain uh, bottle. The product is very, very easily identified as, as illegitimate. So counterfeiting is starting to become an issue. And you know, as the years go on, these, these negative forces in the market you know, continue to mount and continue to, to push the counterfeiting issue. Um, demand is continuing to go up during these years. Uh, again, um, when, the, when the crackdowns were starting, steroids were just becoming uh, you know, well-known uh, in the public. You know, going into the 90s and, and into 2000 and on, they're becoming more popular. Prohibition's intensifying. Um, policies, uh, criminalizing possession of policies even has spread outside the United States um, you know, in some areas. And of course, the trade, again, um, is being uh, more cracked down on by, by authorities. Um, so all this means, again, the legitimate supply is getting smaller and smaller while the demand for these drugs is, uh, is increasing. So now let's fast forward to what we're looking at today. Now, this is, these aren't official statistics. This is my estimation of, of what we're looking at. Um, whereas in the 1970s, early 80s, 60s, we had a market that was almost 100% pharmaceutical grade. Now we're, uh, you know, now we're looking at about, I would wager that we have maybe 20% uh, of legitimate pharmaceutical grade products. Um, some of those you might, might consider um, veterinary drugs would fall under that, especially if they're made by, uh, you know, by Western companies. They sometimes are made to the, to the same standards and some other areas are not. So we're looking at a legitimate pharmaceutical grade supply that is very small compared to the drugs that are being traded. Um, right now, you're probably looking at, you know, counterfeit, uh, illegitimate drugs, wh whatever the classification, outnumbering real drugs by about a number of four to one. Um, that's very concerning. 
Now, when we look more closely at the market, um, the drugs that are being traded are, uh, are even more concerning when we get into the health risks and, and what have you. Um, but let me, let me get into what makes up that 80% now. The first uh, part of that is what I would call sophisticated counterfeits. This is industrial scale production. What you have to understand is counterfeiting uh, in the beginning stages was done on a, on a very small scale with very crude equipment. Um, so much money has been going into this market and so much money has been made over the years um, that it's attracted a whole new class of, um, I guess you could say, entrepreneur looking to, uh, to profit on it. And so what we're looking at is counterfeiting now that is getting extremely difficult. Uh, it's so sophisticated that it's very hard to tell the real from the fake. Uh, and I use this as a very good example. This is a Spanish uh, Winstrol product. Uh, on all these photos, the, uh, the real products on the right or on the bottom. But I mean, as you can see, at first glance, this, these products are essentially identical. There's a holographic sticker that's put on the side, stamping. The ampules look, uh, look very close as well. Honestly, the way that I was ever able to uh, differentiate the real from the fake uh, in this regard was, was very minor things. You could tell the, uh, upon microscope examination that the, the box gradients are a little different, and of course the printing on the ampule is a little bit off. I published uh, those results you know, a year or two ago at, at this point and uh, had the manufacturer you know, taken a look. These things would be very easy to fix. Um, so counterfeiting is getting really tough, really high tech, and it's no longer a case where you can give somebody simple recommendations, you know, make sure that um, there's a stamp on the box, uh, look for a hologram sticker. These, these things don't work anymore. At this point, the only one technology that really seems to um, offer any, uh, any kind of hope in terms of dealing with counterfeiting is um, personalized um, individual serial numbers um, that are put on each particular product that can be verified you know, through a manufacturer. And uh, ironically enough, that type of technology seems to be um, a, being adopted by um, the next thing, underground uh, laboratories, not uh, as of yet large scale by legitimate suppliers. So this is the new phenomenon that we're dealing with, um, is the underground steroid. This is now the most abundant source of anabolic steroids in the black market. Really, the, the entire business model has changed for many, for many areas and for many people. And you know, this is essentially the branding of underground products. These are not copies of legitimate pharmaceuticals. Um, these have distinct names that were never used by legitimate drug companies here. We have like Geniza, Axio, Centrop, Diamond, Dutch Lab, um, Eurochem. Um, these, are, um, these are identified largely uh, by consumers as underground products. They understand that these are made by bodybuilders um, you know, for use on the black market. Um, and this model, this production model, is very different than what we're looking at. Um, and again, think back as we, you know, in contrast with the uh, aseptic processing and the, um, the really serious quality controls that we see with uh, pharmaceutical grade products. This is the model now uh, with, with these underground products. The, the raw materials almost exclusively originate in China. Now China, it's certainly not a knock on China. China is a source for a lot of legitimate pharmaceutical products. A lot of countries license facilities over there and will accept um, quality materials uh, from, from Chinese drug manufacturing companies. But that's not what we're really looking at with the underground market. China may have a, a good selection of licensed pharmaceutical companies, but there's an even larger collection of chemical companies. So, I mean, the, the synthesis methods are essentially the same for many drugs, anabolic steroids, as they would be for other chemicals, but, you know, obviously different chemicals involved. Um, but what you have are companies that they're used to doing industrial things, uh, industrial chemicals, dyes, pesticides, fertilizers. Um, they have the capacity to manufacture the steroid materials as well, but they're not made to the same standards. Um, let me give you, for instance, um, the water that's used for the reactions to make the, uh, the materials. Um, in a pharmaceutical lab uh, that's manufacturing these, um, they would use distilled water. It's pure water. Um, in the case of, of these underground labs, they, they, uh, or the uh, facilities that feed these underground labs, um, they use tap water. They um, manufacture or do their reactions in, in standard containers, be it you know, different kinds of metal, whereas a pharmaceutical company 
a manufacturing company for raw materials, they would use a glass line container or inert containers. Um, what happens sometimes is uh, during the reactions, if you're using um, uh, the improper materials, uh, not the right water, the small amounts of trace metals that you would find in tap water um, start collecting in the materials and, and can form contaminants. Okay. Now, in 2010, I was invited to a, a Dutch underground lab, and I was actually able to, to photograph and document the, the process. And, and I think it's, it's an interesting contrast, again, with the, with the pharmaceutical grade manufacturing to, um, to show actually what it's like. Now, this was the work table for the, uh, for the chemist. Uh, this particular chemist was very proud of his work, I do want to add. Um, had a chemistry background, um, used the products himself, had a, uh, apparently a very large local following of people that, that viewed this lab as, um, as a good source of materials. So here we are um, at the beginning of the process. The chemist weighs out, in this case it was 250 grams of testosterone enanthate, uh, measures out the other materials that are going to be used uh, in the manufacturing. Um, and one thing to point out um, right off the bat is the chemist did um, confide in me that that batch of material was not, was not tested for, uh, for purity. Um, this chemist is very familiar with the source that, uh, that he uses. Testosterone enanthate is very distinct. It has an appearance like wax, it's kind of sticky. Um, and also has a particular melting point. So that's how the, this chemist does the, uh, does the testing on the material. It's blended, heated up to mix, and a, a temperature reading is taken. So if um, at a certain temperature point there's undissolved materials in there, um, he knows there's a, possibly a gross uh, contamination problem. But minor contaminants um, would not be detected with this because it's simply a, you know, a visual inspection. Um, then the, the heated mix, now that everything's dissolved, goes in for pre-filtering. This is a first low-level filter to, to kind of get out uh, any kind of gross contamination that would be um, in the product. The filter material is put in a bottle um, and readied for the next stage, which would be uh, considered final filtering. Now here's where the chemist uh, gets a little bit more meticulous in terms of uh, how the materials are handled. You can catch it a little bit in the upper corner. He's uh, put on a bodysuit now. A new Nalgene filter is used. Um, I think it's about two point micron in that case, um, which should filter out all bacteria. Um, can't filter out other drugs or other contaminants, um, but um, yes, yeah, so it would, as long as the environment was properly controlled, which in this case it's not entirely, um, the product should be, uh, should be sterile. Now the filling, takes place, it's a very quick process, takes place with a pre-measured pump, pumps out 10 mils, it goes into a bottle each time. The bottles are capped by hand with a uh, hand crimping device, and uh, here we are with the final product ready to go. Um, now, you know, initially when I had, uh, I had went in there, I expected these uh, operations that were done by hand to be fairly uh, small scale, but I was actually amazed at the speed in which this product was produced, um, and they did say that you know typically they do orders in hundreds per uh, you know per run of product, and they can move through you know them quite quickly, hundreds and in hundreds in a day, um, if they're really working at uh, at full steam. I'd like to say that that last lab was typical, but I don't really think it is. Um, we don't usually get to see inside underground story laboratories unless they're being raided by authorities. Um, so just to give you some quick pictures of some of the other labs that we've seen that were raided. I mean, this one looks like it's set up in a garage. The components are, are kept in bins. You know, clearly not, uh, not a sterile environment or filtered environment that you would, uh, would want to assemble uh, you know, an injected drug product in. Here's, here's another one that's, uh, that's just atrocious, not worth really pointing out all, all the issues with there. I think they're... Uh, they're pretty apparent. This is not uh, pharmaceutical grade production. And again, the steroid raw material supply is not secure. Um, typically, when these underground labs do test their materials, they're just looking for the purity. They want to know how much of the particular steroid is in the material. If it's 95% pure, 90% pure, they may increase the dosage a little bit to compensate. Maybe they won't. Um, but that's, that's essentially it. Um, 
the chemist that, that I spoke with was not testing for other materials, heavy metal contaminants. Um, this type of the testing is expensive and I know it would be nice if these underground labs were doing it, but I don't think many of them are. Now, to assess the quality of what's happening with the black market today, there's, there really hasn't been an organized testing and reporting program. So, so what we're, what we're kind of left to do is look at different analysis reports that come out. Um, sometimes when law enforcement makes an arrest, they send their stuff in for testing. Uh, I've done a bit of the testing myself. And, and I just want to show you what, what we're looking at today in terms of the quality of the substances that, uh, that are being found. Um, the first one is, is a Dutch report. Um, they went through quite a number, over 300 different steroids that were um, confiscated between 1998 and 2004. Um, and they actually analyzed this in two, uh, in two sections, so there was a little bit of a comparison between the years. Um, and what we find is in this is, you know, between 2000 and 2004, 57% of the uh, steroids that were confiscated in the Netherlands did not match what was on the label. Uh, that could mean that they were underdosed, overdosed, um, there was another steroid in there. In this case, 7% contained absolutely no steroids at all. Now, in contrast to 1998, which is a little interesting, um, in 98, 31% of the products didn't match label. It seems as, as though the, the number of counterfeit products may have been potentially a little bit lower back then. But 17% of the ones that, uh, that did not match contained no steroids at all. So it seems that uh, underground and counterfeit drugs are more common today, but perhaps due to you know, greater access to the raw material supply, more are putting actual steroids uh, in their product. But you know, this, this testing, again, is just for, for potency. It's just for us to know whether or not this is a legitimate product. Um, in 2005, the Hartford Courant did something really interesting. They ordered a dozen steroid products from, from three popular websites and sent them right into uh, to a lab for analysis. And they did full analysis on this. They, they looked for, for essentially everything to find out what was in it, not just steroids, bacteria, other components. And what came back was, was pretty remarkable. First off, none of the products matched what was on the label, zero. The, product, the problems were, as you probably would expect, underdosed, overdosed, substitute ingredients. Some materials are much more expensive uh, than others when it comes to anabolic steroids. And if you have people that may not be, it's very difficult even for somebody that's experienced at times to know what compound they're using just on feel. So, Often cheaper ingredients are substituted for more expensive one. But the contamination that this report found was, was just, from my perspective, alarming. Here's some of the things that, uh, that were found in these dozen steroid pro products. Prednisone, uh, betamethasone, these are two corticosteroids, certainly not uh, of much use for building muscle and, and don't belong in this product. The next one, uh, DES, diethylstilbestrol. That's a synthetic estrogen that was pulled from market many years ago um, due to its link to, uh, to cancer in women. I have absolutely no idea what that, uh, what that is doing in here. Uh, benzyl chloride, that can be irritating, not immensely uh, troubling, but it's, a, it's an alkylating agent and a precursor chemical. Um, then we had heavy metal contamination in some products with lead, tin, arsenic, uh, furfural, furfural uh, an industrial processing chemical. Um, this was the first time that I think it really started to sink in, at least if you were following it, that the market um, is not secure anymore. Uh, the products that are, are being circulated, well, many of them contain anabolic steroids, contain a lot of other things, too. So in 2007, I decided to do my own testing for, for the anabolics book. Um, I picked up 14 products, um, all of European origin, and I sent them into the lab, and I wanted to see for myself what, uh, what was happening with them. During my testing in 2007, 21% of the products contained some level of heavy metal contamination. 64% um, were under or overdose. And in this testing, I, I left a 20% margin, which is much more than you would, would accept for a pharmaceutical product. Um, and even with that margin, it was a major problem. And 57% of these products had some type of contamination. Now, at the time, I didn't spend the, the additional money to identify uh, the materials, but we just knew through the, uh, through the fingerprint analysis that there were other, you know, other peaks in the product and there were other things contaminating it. So I went back in 2010, 
uh, for the underground book uh, that I had, I had published. And um, I wanted to do an even more detailed analysis this time. Now, the testing on this is a little across the board. Some things are tested for bacteria. Some things are tested for water. Um, some things are tested for dosage, other wasn't. So I, I'm doing these by sample number um, instead of percentage based because it would be a little uh, inaccurate. Um, so six of the samples, uh, you know, 25% had, um, had some level of uh, bacterial contamination. In many cases, it was extreme level of bacterial contamination, um, even on some oil-based products, um, which should dispel a, a common myth that oil-based steroids will not breed bacteria. They most certainly will. In fact, the most contaminated product I had ever tested was an oil-based steroid that had been uh, partially used and left on a shelf for a while. Um, we went into testing. It was just um, rife with bacteria. And 17 of the samples had some level of contamination. Um, in this case, we didn't see a lot of heavy metals uh, in, in our testing, um, and certainly uh, you know, nothing that was alarming, but we found some other strange stuff, uh, BHT. Um, phthalate, which is a plasticizer chemical that may have leached in from a, from a, from a container that something was stored in, um, but certainly you don't want to be injecting plastic chemicals into yourself. Um, one sample had some amount of kerosene in it. Um, amines and carboline are less uh, concerning. These are you know, organic compounds sometimes used in synthesis, um, but it does denote that probably the raw materi materials that were used were, were of poor quality and certainly not pharmaceutical grade, and also some random fatty acids were, were found in, uh, in the products when we tested them. So the real point I'm, I'm just trying to get across here is that the market for anabolic steroids has changed dramatically over the past 50 years. You know, what started as the, the diversion of legitimate medicines, um, you know, for off-label or uh, non-medical use, um, has, I guess you could say, devolved into a market that's much more uh, represent that you'd much more expect with other uh, drugs, the with other street drugs. The raw materials are shipped as powders now. Um, again, they're they're assembled locally, generally before they're um, at least in the underground uh, compounds before use. So, one of the things that I've really been trying to emphasize to um, to athletes and bodybuilders that are using these drugs um, is the inherent risks of purchasing on the black market. Um, if you have access to it, the importance of, uh, of finding, finding pharmaceutical grade products. Um, in the United States, it's, it's much worse than it is here. I would say that um, I probably see you know, maybe 10% of the products or so as, uh, as being from, uh, from legitimate sources. So um, I think that in addition to, of course, the, the very important uh, services with, uh, with getting people the proper injection equipment and the proper instruction uh, on how to, uh, to use these, comp these drugs if they're going to choose to, um, they really uh, need to understand the risks that are, are involved with, um, with the supply chain and the way it is. So um, that's my presentation for tonight. Um, I'm open to any and all questions. Hope it was uh, of some interest. Thank you.